implementation of the declaration. Can I also welcome our two Mongolian colleagues, who I know are here. Please indicate. Um, they have some leaflets about, or some material about Mongolia itself, and I know they're very keen to talk to you and welcome anyone who can come to the Mongolia and join us at the event in May next year. The events, the final details will be posted on the Coalition website. Can I just see if there are any questions from anyone to Perrette about either the Tallinn process and declaration or the Mongolia event at this stage? Uh, obviously, we feel free to come back later in the meeting. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is go to a, the major project, or one of the major projects of the, um, of the partnership, the Digital Defenders Partnership, which is operated by HIBOS on behalf of the partnership. And Fiaki Janssen is here to just to give us a, an outline of the work of the Digital Defenders Partnership and then have some discussion of that. Fiaki. Uh, thanks. Um, so I wanted to give you an update on what the Digital Defenders Partnership is doing and I would refer to it as DDP because it's quite a long uh, word to mention. Um, but first I want to start telling a little bit about who we are and what we do and then what we've been doing for the last uh, uh, year and a half. Um, so the Freedom Online Coalition wanted to establish a mechanism in which they could respond quicker to digital emergencies that were facing human rights defenders, journalists, bloggers and activists uh, in internet repressive and transitional environments. And this sort of came out uh, after Mubarak in 2011 pulled the internet kill switch. And since then we've seen many other things, uh, digital attacks that are attacking um, human rights defenders and journalists. I think uh, here we in the banning of Twitter and Facebook. Uh, in Pakistan, mobile uh, communication is being throttled at certain moments. Uh, there's been targeted attacks and dragnet surveillance happening uh, to anybody who dares to speak up. Uh, legal uh, avenues are new ways to attack uh, human rights defenders. They're being tried for blasphemy or under national security reasons. Uh, and censorship is also still a bite. So these are very, very big issues, and the globe is a very big space. Uh, and what what do we do? So we. On emergency grants and these are really aimed at uh, if you really need legal support, uh, if you've been hacked and you need to replace your equipment or if you any, need any other type of support that comes from uh, a digital emergency you're facing, uh, you can apply for emergency grants. Uh, we have direct support grants are a little bit bigger. Um, we have a pamphlet in the back that can explain more about these different types of grants and these can be used uh, for instance for security audit of organizations because once we found out we've been attacked it's usually already too late so where do you start you start by fixing the vulnerabilities that you have first um, and we also have strategic partnerships and these are sorts of structural investments in things that are needed to respond to uh, emergencies that are faced and then the second thing we do is linking and learning because, uh, well, the entire conference has been talking about it, but it's quite a new sector. Uh, people have been facing uh, threats all along from harassment to people following on the street, giving phone calls. But DDoS attacks to uh, websites, for instance, or malware, they're quite a recent phenomenon. And how do we respond to this? And this also means that um, individuals who do reach out to international organizations usually reach out to multiple. So what we try to do is we provide we try to get people together to coordinate the actions better uh, some people might have closer ties to companies while other might have closer ties to malware experts so how can we piggyback on each other's expertise um, and under this linking and learning we've also started working on pre-planning because um, as we all know social and political events around the world inspire sort of surveillance on steroids we've seen it in Russia <laughs> Uh, during the Olympics, but also in Brazil during the World Cup. And all of a sudden, everything is legitimatized because we don't want uh, something bad to happen during these events. But yes, the surveillance practices continue going and they usually also target uh, critical voices. And then people also come to us directly. That's the third thing we do for help. And then um, we try to find the right person who can help them, which is usually a local security expert uh, or a professional uh, secure hoster who can make, mitigate their attacks. 
So this is all nice. So what have we done in the last uh, year and a half? And I think uh, so through the DDP and through our strategic partners, we've supported 153 organizations and uh, over 700 individuals uh, who are facing a digital attack. And this is in countries ranging from Central Asia, uh, Africa, Middle East and North Africa, uh, the Asia region, but and Latin America. And basically, these, these incidences have related to either providing circumvention technology, so this can be VPN, but we've also provided support to the Tor infrastructure and other things. Legal support, because unfortunately, legal avenues are used more and more to silence people. Uh, we provide support to uh, local security consultants who help people out, because most human rights defenders and media organizations, if you work with them and they get attacked, they don't know where to start or what to do. So they need somebody to help them uh, guide through the process. We set up temporary helplines where people uh, were in local languages when uh, violence spiked or when journalists are getting targeted. Think of countries like Venezuela or Ukraine or uh, Thailand. We're providing secure hosting uh, and malware analysis. Um, and I just want to say that uh, a month ago, we also launched the Digital First Aid Kit. This is done from a collaboration between almost more than 15 organizations working in this field. And it was really a collaborative effort. And it's supposed to guide you through the steps of what to do when you think you get hacked, or when you have are being DDoSed, or when you've had to hand over your phone or your uh, laptop when you cross a border and you got it back. Um, and if you have ideas or uh, for potential mitigation strategies, or when you are facing a digital emergency, uh, please come and talk to us. Uh, we're, we'll be here at the end of the session, but we also, HIVOS has a booth um, in sort of the pavilion, uh, and we'll be there for the next two days as well. And you can always reach us by email, uh, phone, or look at our website, send us a DM. That was it. Thanks. Are there any questions or comments you'd like to make to Fioca at this stage about the partnership? No hands? Okay. Obviously, such a convincing presentation, there were no, no doubts or ambiguities <laughs> in anyone's mind. I do encourage you to actually, uh, sorry, Marcus, yeah? Thank you very much. First of all, I have to say I'm quite impressed by all these activities uh, you are having. My name is Wolfgang Benedek, University of Graz, Austria. Um, I wanted to, uh, to ask you um, uh, from which side uh, you get funding for, this, for the, all these activities, and in particular if the European Union, uh, with its uh, strategy uh, of uh, helping uh, digital defenders, is part of those who support it. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so the Digital Defenders Partnership was something that got established under the Freedom Online Coalition. So currently seven nation states within the FOC are uh, donating to the partnership uh, and the EU is not uh, part of the FOC. But we do coordinate with a lot of their activities that are going on in the field. Thanks Wolfgang. Anyone else would like to put a question or comment? Okay, thanks. We'll move on. The other, uh, another new feature of the work of the coalition this year has been the creation of working groups, uh, multi-stakeholder working groups to examine issues on which uh, the coalition has an interest and where new thinking and policy development can take place. So we have two of the co-chairs of two of the working groups that have been established and I'll first of all come to Simone Hallink to tell us a bit about the working groups and also the process and how we intend to construct them and build them in the future. Simone. Light on. on now, yes. All right. Well, I think uh, we've had a very eventful summer when it comes to the working groups. Over the conference we had in Tallinn in um, April, we sort of discussed uh, how to take the working groups further. We um, made sort of the decided on the framing of the first and the third working group and, uh, and got to work. Um, basically, we decided on a process which um, uh, was framing the working groups. We made terms of reference for the working groups and then uh, opened the working groups up for applications from uh, me members from, uh, from different uh, stakeholder groups. 
Um, over the summer, those um, applications were reviewed and, uh, and we got to a, a selection. And both working groups now consist of, if I'm correct, about sort of 15 uh, uh, members from civil society and, uh, and private sector. And then uh, in the case of the working group that I'm uh, co-chairing with, uh, with Ron Diebert, which is on uh, a, working a working group called An Internet Free and Secure. who is the director of Citizen Lab um, in Canada. And uh, the other countries involved are the US, the UK, um, and Canada. Um, so when we had sort of the group together, we thought of a way to develop a, a, a common starting point. Because of course the, the field of cybersecurity is very broad. People have different backgrounds. And, um, and we, we sort of started with a framing of cybersecurity and also how you could embed human rights uh, issues into cybersecurity strategies. Um, and so to sort of be able to talk to that with the whole group and to see where to go uh, and to, to create a common starting ground, we um, issued um, a, a, a reading list that everybody could, could read. It's also online for people who are interested. And we also uh, sent out a questionnaire with um, questions like, uh, how do you define cybersecurity? Uh, what issues are most urgent at the moment. How do you? What are the what are the principles underlying it? Similar questions for um, uh, the multi-stakeholder model, and then of course we also asked more practical questions like, what do you see as a desired outcome? Uh, how would you like to communicate? Like just very very simple questions, but which are essential for like the cooperation. Um, and over the last couple of weeks, we received those, those inputs and we made a first analysis of it. And then yesterday, we actually came together with the group uh, to discuss it. And that was like, it, was, it was very mo motivating and inspiring. We have a fantastic group of, I think we were there with about um, 12 people yesterday. And there's, there's more, there's actually more in the group, but we weren't able to sort of have everybody here. Um, but we had a first discussion about these issues and where to take the working group. And uh, it was very constructive and, uh, and, and actually lots of fun, of course, to work with a group of inspiring people to sort of to bring such an issue further. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's 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 in progress, so I can't really share like the any definite outcomes, but I can share with you sort of a couple of the directions that came out of the discussion yesterday, in which we will be exploring further in the upcoming weeks. So the first thing that we'll be doing is to bring sort of the input that we've gathered in, uh, bring it together in a report that will refine on a couple of issues. So we'll refine the framing. Um, we'll also look at the, the, the definition of cybersecurity. Um, we'll look at the principles underlaying it further. And we'll also think about sort of the voc vocabulary, that, vocabulary that is often used in cybersecurity, which often have for different people, for different parties, different meanings. And so we think that's a very important issue to tackle as well. Um, then we want to see if we can um, map the, um, uh, the, the multi-stakeholder model, or at least, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm actually saying this wrong, sort of mapping in what forum cybersecurity is discussed, uh, how those forums work, and how multi-stakeholder participation uh, could be further developed there. Because what we see is actually that a lot of, there is lots of discussion on cybersecurity, but only very few people have a full oversight of, 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 of what forms there are and, and, and how everything fits together. So we think this could be an important added value of the working group. Then also within the working group, there's a, um, the, a great interest in seeing how we could develop norms on how human rights can be embedded in national cybersecurity strategies. Um, and so this is also something that we want to explore. And over the next couple of weeks with the working group, we'll sort of make an action plan on how to take this forward and, um, and what types of output we can generate within these two contexts. In any case, the first sort of next thing that we'll probably do, um, and which will also be published um, uh, to the rest of the world, is a report that I refer to. Um, and so we think that will be published sometime later this fall. Um, and as soon as we sort of have an action plan with the working group, we'll probably also be able to share a little bit more on that. Thanks very much, Simone. Um, I'll go straight to Catherine Kendrick on, to deal with the other working group, and then I'll open up for questions and discussion on both groups together. Catherine. All right, so 
the sun. Um, my name is Catherine Kendrick. I'm with the Center for Business and Human Rights at NYU Stern, and we co-chair the third working group with, along with the UK. Um, the third working group is dedicated to the topic of increasing transparency from governments and companies, and in particular, how they interact on issues that implicate the freedom of expression and privacy of their users. Um, and so today, uh, as with Working Group 1, we had our first meeting of the members, which we selected through applications this summer. Um, and one of the first things we did as Working Group over the summer was an inventory of existing efforts on transparency in the ICT sector, and particularly around government requests to companies um, on user takedown, user for user data and on content takedown. And one of the things we found through that inventory and in our conversation today is that a lot a lot of the conversation about transparency in the last couple of years and a lot of the movement has been focused on uh, company reporting and increasing transparency uh, on the company side. And one of the defining characteristics of this working group, of course, is the involvement of governments and the collaboration among civil society, companies, and governments. And so um, we discussed in our meeting today taking advantage of this group to take a more holistic approach of looking at reporting by governments, reporting by companies, and reporting on the interface between the two uh, to give more transparency to how the two parties interact. Um, so much of our conversation today focused on what some have called or considered the more qualitative components of transparency. Uh, there's quite a lot of work on increasing quantitative information on the number of requests to companies, the number of requests coming from governments. Uh, uh, the today working group members expressed interest also in uh, filling out sort of the policy framework laws and processes that go on on the government side and the company side when it comes comes to requests for individuals data or content takedown. And to kick off the working group discussion, the Global Network Inif Initiative and the Center for Democracy and Technology, which are both members of the group, uh, submitted a letter in advance of the meeting with specific transparency measures that FOC governments could take. And so that gave us a good platform for initial discussion among the groups. Uh, and as an immediate next step, some of the governments in, that, in the working group have a pledge to take back that letter to other agencies in their governments and get feedback on the, the measures that GNI and CDT proposed and on you know, what would be immediately possible in terms of um, increasing transparency and also what would the potential obstacles be. One of the things that we discussed that applies both on the company and government side is that even having a conversation about what the challenges are in increasing transparency and what the potential obstacles are will help us help move the community towards a better conversation about what the reality should be when it comes to having as much information as possible. Um, so as an immediate next step, we'll be following up with that conversation from the GNI and CDT level uh, letter. And in the coming uh, weeks, we'll be refining our scope of work further. We didn't have the full group here today, as with Working Group 1, so we're um, still getting consensus from the full members. Um, and also identifying what a valuable, uh, tangible outcome would be by um, the Mongolia conference next May. Uh, we're conscious that it's a six-month timeline, at, or if you subtract December for the holidays. Um, and the members of the group emphasized the value of having some concrete outcome that may be and probably will be a starting point for hopefully a renewal of the group's mandate and continued uh, uh, work on this topic. Uh, but we're interested in finding something that's both reasonable and concrete for governments and other stakeholders to consider on the topic of increasing transparency. Um, just before I open it up, can I just ask if, as a, I mean, obviously an enormous community here of knowledge and experience who could, uh, in addition to the, obviously the experts you've got on the working group, if people here are interested in following the working group activity and maybe contributing thoughts and reflections on any of the documents you produce, will there be a means, obviously through our webs, we had the website is available, are, are you happy to welcome that kind of broader contribution from the community?
I think is, am I okay? Uh, I think um, uh, this is also like for sure like the, there's it's clear that we as a working group it's an, it's an open working group. it was an open working group in the sense that the application was open to anyone of course to make it workable you have to make a selection at some point and start working with a core group of dedicated people and um, I think one of the things that will I have to think about is the way that we will engage with other people and the opportunities we will create for that. I think uh, doing that, of course, via the website and publishing uh, uh, documents could be a very valuable um, a means, but I could also see that maybe uh, at a next conference we would actually organize a meeting which we open up for a much broader uh, uh, public where we would discuss a couple of the issues that we're working on and, and, and get feedback through through means like that. So I think uh, the ways we, we, we want to do that is something that we'll probably sort of have to develop just like the rest that we're doing but will definitely be open for um, for engaging with other people and, and, and hearing feedback. Catherine? Uh, yeah, similarly, one of the things we discussed as a group this summer was um, the willingness to welcome feedback from people outside the group on all phases of the project, and we'll have various public documents along the way for, uh, for comment. Okay, I'm going to open it up. Um, uh, obviously, we're a community of people who love to enter rooms and sit and do email together in silence. But let's occasionally reflect that with a lot of human beings in the room, it might be nice sometimes to talk to each other and not just do email. So um, let's have some conversation. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Courtney Raj. I'm with the Committee to Protect Journalists. And one of the things that I uh, was wondering to what extent I understand that the Freedom of Online Coalition is not involved in the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals at all, but I would like to urge you to take a position on inclusion of an indicator on freedom of expression and internet access. There is a whole initiative going along um, to try to get this onto the agenda and I think that this falls right within um, the agenda of the FOC. I think um, it's somewhat less political perhaps than many of the things, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, other things that you're working on. I think that it's a way that could make a very powerful statement. It would be important and help us in our advocacy across the community when we're going to the UN to say, hey, you know, the Freedom Online Coalition governments have supported this. You know, we really used your support in New York. So happy to follow up. There's other groups, Article 19, GFMD, who are working on this, so we can follow up afterwards. But I hope that that's something that you guys can make a statement on. Thanks. We'll kind of ask some of the government reps to respond to that and just take a, another question from here. Yes, it's uh, Walid al sakaf uh, from Yemen. Uh, you know, uh, the Arab world is one of those regions that does appreciate help in, this, in these tough circumstances. Uh, however, uh, amidst my experience in training in aspects of uh, censorship circumvention, for example, and also aspects c concerning privacy issues, I realized that the language barrier is a huge, huge issue. Uh, and uh, one thing that we often find is deficit in trainers from the region. Not only is it because of language, but also because of fear and, and various various other aspects. Do you find that this could be a potential, um, let's say, a problem to work on, perhaps with through consultation with us in the region to understand the best means to go forward with it? Because there is a lot of need, yet not much in response. Thanks. And I don't know if. Um Either Carl Frederick or Scott, you'd like to pick up on any of those points while we're while we're here. Carl, yeah. um, let, I could just pick up on the um, on the question on the um, post 2015 development goals that was asked, and I think this is a very important point that is raised. Um, I think many many FOC member countries have identified this issue and are pushing for this issue in the MDG um, or the SDG um, negotiations. Uh, but this is obviously a particular context in New York, and it's a very very difficult um, negotiation. But I am very grateful for raising the issue, and I think it is something that deserves to be raised more widely, also within the FOC. So I would want to thank you for that um, suggestion. Thanks. Um, Scott, anything you want to add to that? Or? Thank you, uh, Courtney, for that uh, suggestion. Yeah, as Carl mentioned, the inclusion of human rights in the uh, SDGs is not an uncontroversial uh, topic, although there are uh, elements there now. Uh, but I think the idea of adding in access and freedom of expression is a good one, and uh, we'll look into that. 
Um, and in response to our colleague from the Yemen, I guess the, does the Digital Defenders Partnership, would it extend into considering the capacity building in that kind of training area, or is that an issue that would require further discussion in the coalition? Uh, I think it's an issue that requires further discussion in the Freedom Online Coalition, also because uh, the DDP is actually specifically aimed at mitigating emergencies and digital security is also more trainings or more structural um, inv investments. And I know individual members, uh, nations of the FOC, like uh, the US State Department, but also the Dutch government and the Swedish government are investing heavily separately on digital security issues uh, regarding more digital security training. So I think uh, it's something they should talk about as a collective. If I could have your card, we could kind of come back to you on that after the meeting. Thank you, Andrew. My name is Xian Hong from uh, UNESCO. As a UN agency promoting free expression online offline, I fully second this uh, good idea to to highlight uh, a post-2015 development agenda in the, in the free online uh, discussion. And I think it really fits the discussion in the Mongolian meeting next year. It's 2015. It's really a year that uh, it's really a, mainst a mainstreaming uh, opportunity to discuss that in the Mongolia and uh, I, I actually we have already liaised with our colleagues based in Mongolia, based in, in East Asia, based in Beijing, which covers Mongolia, to to uh, to get involved in the Mongolian conference in Fundo And uh, also, I, my second point is to 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 connect uh, the uh, the issues about uh, the intermediaries. I also appreciate that uh, so many key issues are being picked uh, by Freedom Line Coalition, and uh, UNESCO has been engage in this uh, topic uh, as well. Actually, we are going to launch a new research on intermediaries role in, pro in fostering free expression on Friday. Uh, we have explored the three categories of the internet uh, intermediaries, including search engines, uh, social media platforms, and the ISPs as a phase one study. I feel that uh, both of us, we really fit each other to, to, to consolidate some outcomes. And uh, lastly, I want to uh, also appreciate that uh, the, the, the long uh, connection between UNESCO and the Freedom Line Coalition. We have been involved in the, almost every conference and have uh, uh, had the opportunity to provide by the inputs to the Tallinn uh, Declaration, and really congratulations for this outcome. Uh, we are also doing a comprehensive study to provide a sort of recommendation for the future options on the internet governance principles, which we are going to discuss tomorrow at our open forum. We have well considered this Tallinn consideration, Tallinn, Tallinn Declaration into uh, the UNESCO study as well. Thank you very much. I'll come to Edit Ojo from Nigeria at the back. Thanks, Andrew. My name is Edith Ojo. I come from Nigeria. I, I see that the membership of the coalition is growing very slowly, but my, my question is, uh, do you really think that you're making a difference in, in terms of online freedoms, uh, especially in the light of the fact that anxieties seem to be growing about online freedoms, and some of your members are responsible for causing this anxiety? So do you really think that uh, uh, you're making a difference with your presence and activities? Thanks. I'll take one more and then come back to the platform. Uh, yep, yeah, I'm coming to you. Thank you. I'm Gisela Kapper, Minister of Science and Technology from Costa Rica. Being in Latin America and having only two countries participating in this uh, coalition, it's Mexico and Costa Rica, we do embrace uh, our mission of, of supporting much more memberships from other countries, and that's what we are going to do in the region. But it's very important to highlight that besides, of course, freedom online and all transparency and accountability issues, in our region, we are still dealing much more with accessibility and education on how to use internet. So. These uh, issues are very important as human rights, but we have first to deal with uh, accessibility and getting every people access to the internet. So that's 
uh, uh, priorities that comes in, but of course we will always deal with human rights and of course the, the freedom on, online. So be sure that from Costa Rica we will be trying to get more members to this coalition, at least from the Central American region where we deal with much of our countries uh, in the region. Thank you. Thanks, and I'll, I'll take one more section before moving on to the, the next stage from here. Thank you. Uh, Artyom Garayna from Kyrgyzstan, Civil Initiative on Internet Policy. So uh, uh, I would uh, like to um, propose uh, some idea that was actually uh, briefly mentioned uh, at the meeting of previous working group, but uh, stopped because it was decided that's the uh, wrong time. Idea of benchmarking countries. Uh, benchmarking the legislation and actual implementation of this legislation uh, related to internet freedom. So it's a sort of, uh, I think this activity would be extremely useful for all countries, like to clear defining dimensions that can be used to evaluate uh, legislation and its implementation, and to evaluate uh, all countries inside Freedom Online Coalition, and to uh, create a clear methodology for this evaluation. So I think it, uh, uh, it can help to understand Freedom Online and coalition countries where they are, and uh, it could help extremely useful for other countries to know where they can go. So, like that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So, I think a couple of points there. First, are we making a difference? I, I guess I'm going to bowl that one at, at, at maybe Simone. And <laughs> as the founder, as the, com the government that really kicked this off, what's yours? Obviously, work in progress, but over the years since the actual founding conference in The Hague, what do you, what's your sense? Well, um, I think I'll, I'll also um, answer this question from surely from a, a Dutch perspective, but also from a personal perspective, as I've been sort of on, on this job for nine months, and I think since then I've seen actually sort of lots of activity. Um, I come from civil society, and, and I think for that I always sort of want to see action right away, um, and I'm not always used to sort of political um, maneuvering, uh, b which often takes a lot more time. Um, but I think sort of the experience that, um, my experience in, in Mongolia last week, I think is, is um, sort of exempt is an example for, for where I think the opportunity of the coalition can lay. Um, so we went on a scouting mission last week for the, the conference, as Beret already m mentioned. And of course, Mongolia is located in a, on a very, in a very special location between Russia and China, which um, both have, um, a, a, let's say, a difficult policy when it comes to internet freedom. Um, and uh, around there, and especially also in Asia, I think this, the, the, the situation is actually becoming, ha has become worse over the last, uh, well, uh, it's been a period, but over this last year we've seen uh, a couple of worrying develop developments. Uh, at the same time, also, like, um, uh, Mongolia is a very young democracy. Uh, they're very open to human rights. They're very open to, to democratic principles. But they're still building their, um, b building very hard on, uh, on, on, that, on that structure. And so what, what's very interesting is that um, having the, co the conference there will not only give the coalition um, an opportunity to sort of promote internet freedom in the region, which at least will give lots of stakeholders in the region and lots of other countries an opportunity to uh, raise issues there, um, participate in a, in a, in a, in a high-level uh, conference, um, but will also be an opportunity for Mongolia itself uh, to um, actually put internet freedom on the agenda there. There's recently been, been a, 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 a legal proposal in Parliament to actually embed internet freedom in the country. Um, but at the same time, there's also worrying develop developments uh, a blogger was recently imprisoned for uh, sharing thoughts on uh, corruption f via Twitter. So there you see that actually the conference will probably make a big difference in, in the country itself. If I then look at what the, 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 the Freedom Online Coalition has done over the last couple of months, I think we have actually made a difference. At least we've, made, we've created, again, a couple of starting points which um, will make us, I think, very valuable. We've recently um, released a social, social media statement, or at least a, a statement on social media 
media blocking that we'll discuss in a little bit. Um, we've developed the working groups which are um, uh, uh, dealing with issues which um, are very important and should be brought further in, in the context uh, of internet freedom and we've had lots of interest to participate in that. We have the recommendations which we're taking on very seriously and will report back on, uh, uh, on the next uh, FOC conference. And I think with that you actually see where we make the difference. And I understand maybe that sometimes not everything we do and not all the dip diplomatic effort um, uh, that we put into this coalition is seen. But if you have any suggestions or if, if you think there are specific things where we should be doing more, uh, is exactly the reason why we're here and you should raise it. And I think we're trying also via the website and, and, and these kind of uh, um, uh, panels, but also through the work of the support unit to make us more um, approachable for, for discussing issues like those. The ability and access point that the Minister from Costa Rica mentioned. I know that Sweden has seen this as a key element of the work that it wants to pursue. So I guess you would endorse their sentiment that that's something that in the course of the coalition we are likely to focus on. Well, I'd, I'd like to just address um, also the first point raised by the gentleman from Nigeria um, as well. I've been, I've been involved in this field now for a couple of years and um, I've been doing a lot of the negotiations in the UN context for, uh, specifically. And I think in that context, it's very clear that it is of great value to have a um, set of um, member countries who share values that extend uh, between regional groups um, that unite them beyond their usual block voting patterns. Um, that has been um, a very clear gain with this, with this um, Oh, coalition. Uh, regarding the question about accessibility and and, and um, human rights and expression, I I kind of don't don't see those two as as a as a dichotomy or opposites. I think that often we we tend to portray that debate as being access first or human rights second. I don't think that is um, that is necessarily uh, any contradiction between the two. I mean, for, uh, Sweden puts puts um, a lot of emphasis on on building access uh, and on constructing infrastructure um, in developing countries, but I think what we are seeing now is the need for more um, more and better regulation and better uh, rule of law mechanisms um, within this field. Um, and that is, I think, especially important in those countries that are experiencing very fast growth, um, because this is indeed the formative stage um, for those countries. Once um, legislation and regulation are put into place, it has becomes much harder to fix that. Um, I will just revert briefly back to um, the working group number two, which is Sweden is chairing, which has not yet started. Um, this was originally designed to look at the connection between an open internet and economic growth. We are reframing that somewhat to look more towards the connection between rule of law and uh, development, not least to serve as a guide for development efforts uh, in this field, uh, which we're investing heavily in. Um, we also note that the World Bank will be um, prioritizing this field in their World, World Development Report for next year, which will be titled uh, Internet and, and Development, which will also serve as a useful guide for how to implement um, rights and uh, online for a um, more development-oriented ICT landscape. So, yeah, thanks. Move on, I know, because there's another issue. On the benchmarking point, I think we need to come back to you on that. That's something that this coalition is it's reflecting, whether what would be the added value of a benchmarking exercise in addition to the existing benchmarks that exist, like the Web Index or Freedom House and so on, and how the coalition can best help in raise the general standards of, uh, amongst its, its partners and members. So I think, I think it's, that's something we need to reflect on and I think come back to you in, in, in due course. Um, the, the other issue we wanted to flag up, unfortunately we can't get the website up. Um, we think it's just the internet connectivity and nothing more sinister than that. But we do have uh, a website launched this year, uh, freedomonlinecoalition.com if any of you can access it. And last week, uh, the coalition posted a, a major statement negotiated among the members on dealing with their increasing concern at restrictions on social media, which is something that I've heard, and I guess we all have, in a lot of panels and discussions at this conference. There's a growing tide of restriction. And I want to, first of all, before we come to the statement and the government's response, just get a couple of perspectives from civil society and business on the nature of that problem. I want to start with Ahmet Sabanchi from, very pleased to welcome him today, from the Alternative Informatics Association, who are uh, co-organizing the UNConference, which will happen on Thursday and Friday 
at Bilgi University, a, a gathering of civil society groups and others in Turkey. He'll say a bit about that. But just to tell us a bit about the social media problems you're seeing in Turkey and how it's impacting on yourself and others like you as writers, bloggers and activists. Thank you. Thanks. Well, first of all, as probably most of you heard, that ex-Prime Minister and the now President of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, calls social media as a menace. And he has a good reason for that, because the Turkish government, all, Turkish governments always has the power on the media, both, both television, newspapers, magazines, and other media stuff. But when internet came came around, they couldn't understand how how they can how how they can govern it, how can how they can stop the free information on that because internet wasn't for for them, and they always works against them because they can't just censor everything they want they they can't do this like the old ways and now they are they are calling in menace and right now in Turkey we have more than 50,000 websites blocked and it's getting more and more every day but we couldn't know the exact number because everything they they done they have done on the internet is close to the public we couldn't get any information from them we don't know what they are doing on on both censorship and surveillance just we are testing learning trying and trying to get information as, as we do. Also, 5651 is the Turkish version of the internet bill, and it was it was get it was renewed at the February of this year, and it get much worse in every sense. For example, Tib of the Turkey now has the right to censor and block any website they want without any court order. They have right to right to stop any websites located in Turkey and they can do with a, a, like any court order again also they have right on the ISPs right now and now they the government forced all ISPs to start a union and this union is this union has to obey what government and what government wants from them and they have to do everything they did otherwise they can they can take an, their li license will be taken away and they can't have any right to serve people people anyway also as maybe you heard about the 29 twitter users recently arrested and put in jail just because they have used twitter to spread news about the gezi protests so they don't really have any base for this arrest but they are using the anti-terror laws for that also we have we have new surveillance tools started to using and they are planning to use in here for example turkish government now forces all the isps to use DPI technology to log all the information and keep it open for them whenever they want. And also they are forcing all kinds of legal tools and illegal tools to suppress activists, journalists, and try to auto-censor themselves or directly censor them. So basically we don't really have so much f internet freedom or human rights in Turkey and we are, we are having real hard times in here but somehow Turkish government doesn't want to accept that they just want to say that everything looks fine everything goes great and uh, internet in Turkey is an amazing place you don't have the, there was there isn't any censorship on surveillance so that's I guess one of the reasons why one none of the, our proposals for the IGF accepted we made five proposals for the IGF actually none of them directly about the Turkish Turkey situation but somehow being from Turkey I guess stopped us from ma making workshops here so this was the main reason why we are doing the internet ungovernance forum 
at September 4th, 4th and 5th. We, are, we basically think that if we can't get any workshop and panels in Internet Governance Forum, governance forum we should go there anyway, and we should also make a side event to talk about the things we d we couldn't have time or space, or we couldn't also other people that couldn't have time for space to talk issues like that. So we are all we are all inviting anyone who wants to interested about the, what civil society says, what activists, journalists, and other groups says, and also come and talk with us, talk. We want to talk every single one of you to how can we do something about to change the situation in here. And also, we really wanted to help all activists and other groups that around the world to work together. And we really wanted to do something good both in here. And that's why we are at the IGF. And that's why we are doing the Internet on Governance Forum. There are brochures at the back about more detailed information, both in situation in Turkey and both about the Internet on Governance Forum. You are all invited. And if you want to learn about more in situation in Turkey or you want to talk about or want to help us, feel free to talk, talk with me after the panel. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ahmed. That's great. It's great you could be here and, and join us and, and share the experiences. And I'm, I'm sorry we weren't able to have a see broader discussion in the IGF as a whole. Um, I just want to move on to, uh, from the business point of view, to Marcus from Google. Uh, you're a major provider of social media, so I guess you're seeing patterns throughout the world. Can you just tell us the kind of pattern you're detecting and how you think the social media restrictions, whether it's going up, getting worse? Just give us an overall flavor of the situation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So for who doesn't know me, I'm Marco Pancini from uh, the Google Brussels policy team. Actually, the trend that we are seeing uh, globally is, is going in the direction of more and more threads to, to open spaces for, for internet users to provide uh, contribution to the debate. Sometimes the form of, of these uh, threads are censorship, the basic censorship, but sometimes is, uh, is something more different and more subtle. I would say that uh, the all uh, um, the all uh, pressure uh, towards uh, intermediaries to limit the space for, for, for the spaces for users to express their opinion uh, can assume different forms. For example, very recently, uh, the whole debate around the right to be forgotten created uh, some kind of uh, um, misunderstanding around the kind of balance that intermediaries need to keep between the right to uh, allow access to information, the right to, to allow users to enforce very important uh, fundamental rights, like the right to have control over the information that uh, are about them online. So that's, that's a first area that probably requires further discussion. And we believe uh, that uh, through the initiative that we launched with the advisory committee, that is helping us in looking at the ethical consequence of, of the right to be forgotten or the right to deletion, as we call it, we can really move forward the debate in the, in the, in the direction of making more clarity. Another trend that we see, and it's quite worrying, is, is uh, the whole pressure from governments uh, to go for data localization. Data localization uh, is, uh, per se, uh, from, from, from a business perspective, is, is uh, against the whole concept of the free flow of information and actually the, the idea that all, all, all service providers should be able to compete in, 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 in a very uh, open and effective way globally, but as other, other important consequence, which is um, giving to governments more control over the data that are flowing in their national networks and also providing them more power of enforcement over the data that are collected and are, and, and, and are stored in a, in a given country. That's why we generally tend to, to, to consider data localization in most of the cases as a dangerous exercise, especially because not always comes together with uh, uh, transparency. And then I would like to arrive to the third point, and 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 and, and again, and that that for us are, these are our priorities uh, how to 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 counterbalance all all these threats: transparency, accountability, and the rule of law. 
are uh, absolutely something that we put on top of our policy priorities. We are pushing these uh, uh, in, in different ways. We totally support the call for transparency from the coalition. We believe that more and more governments and industry should uh, embrace transparency as, as a general policy. We have seen a lot of progress. Sometimes we tend, for example, to look at the discussion that we are having at the IGF as um, we don't, you know, people usually say that there are not really follow-up, there are not really progress, but if we look like three, four years ago, when we were talking about transparency, we were really few, few, few companies and, and, and a few even 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 uh, governments were looking at transparency with with not uh, the, say, the same approach today we think that the transparency is the only way to restore confidence and trust between companies uh, between business uh, between governments and the internet user and that's the way forward the rule of law uh, it's uh, absolutely important especially in the context of the old, all the debate around surveillance uh, there is no way to move forward in the debate around government surveillance b without reinforcing the rule of law and the importance of of having clear procedures uh, in order to access to information, in order to enforce the existing, the, the, the existing laws. And then on top of that accountability, that's why we want to be very active in the debate in, in all of the multi-stakeholder forum, including the, in the internet governance. This is why we believe that we'll be more than happy to come and, and listen uh, at the debate at the governance forum, because again, there is not one single stop shop for talking about these issues uh, and and companies should be very open and uh, and um, very open and very present in the debate in order to answer questions and and be and be be part of um, receive, receive also criticism um thanks very much marcus and ahmed for painting the picture both from the on the grass ground and the grassroots in Turkey and the wider corporate uh, pers uh, uh, perspective. I mean, Scott Busby, if I come to you from the State Department, how, how does the world look from how you see it in terms of the growing climate around social media and restrictions? And what was the thinking inside the coalition that defend, you know, why did the coalition feel the need to do, develop a statement on social media restrictions? Thanks, Andrew. Well, needless to say, we're quite concerned. Um, uh, it's not only situations like Turkey, it's uh, situations in Russia, Vietnam, Thailand, Iraq. We're just seeing a proliferation of uh, attempts to shut down social media, limit activity on social media, uh, and that's why we felt it was uh, justified to try and come together as a coalition and issue a statement on this, which I would note is the only, only the second time that the Freedom Online Coalition has issued a statement. So I think it's a, a, a one example of how the Freedom Online Coalition is uh, uh, making, making a difference. Uh, look, uh, under Article 19, states do have uh, the ability to limit speech but in very, very narrow ways when it threatens the national security public order uh, or the rights or reputations of others. And while governments are using these sorts of rationales to crack down on social media, they're doing so in uh, overbroad, general, and uh, vague ways. Um, we've seen uh, governments uh, ratcheting up their efforts to enforce uh, rules uh, couched in these uh, terms. Um, we've seen governments putting onuses on uh, internet service providers, uh, um, corporations, to kind of partner with governments in carrying out these restrictions or not allow that a company to do business uh, inside the country. Um, and we're seeing situations uh, such as those in Thailand and Iraq where the government simply asserts a broad national security concern and then radically limits the way in which uh, social media uh, platforms are regulated and, and or restricted. Um, so we're, we are greatly concerned. We think uh, many of these actions go above and beyond what uh, international uh, law permits. Uh, and that's why we felt uh, uh, the need to collectively speak out uh, about this growing and, and worrisome trend. Thanks, and if I could just come to Carl Frederick. Um, I, I know you, you work a lot at the UN in some very tough 
and I think often hostile negotiating environments. Um, how do, wh what do you think is driving these increasing climate of social res restrictions on social media? How, where do you see it coming from, and how do you see the importance of the coalition in taking a clear stand and a state making a statement about the, the problem that it's highlighting? Well, <laughs> thanks, Andrew. Well, I think it's, it's quite clear that um, there's generally been a very much of a hardening of the environment surrounding freedom of expression issues, not only when it comes to the internet, but broadly. Um, I think it's specifically concerned, we're very much concerned specifically when it comes to um, freedom online, because we do see a tendency to treat the online environment as being something separate from um, the real world. Um, and this is a line of argumentation that we can see in um, in many different foras, we see, for instance, um, increased pressure on treating um, internet issues separate from other uh, aspects of the same issues, whether it comes to security or democracy and so forth, and thereby creating a, a freestanding set of norms for um, the internet. Um, for our, from our perspective, this is obviously long term would mean a um, a hollowing of um, human rights norms because in 20 years time it's it's hard to think of any human activity that will not at least to some extent uh, play out on the internet so um, with a long perspective this is indeed a, a, a crucial future for human rights broadly um, I think that in this context it's been very important to see that we've been able to um, assemble a consensus in the Human Rights Council at two occasions around a resolution text that uh, does confirm that human rights do apply online as they do offline. Um, the original text um, was from 2012, a resolution there which was taken by consensus then was uh, reaffirmed earlier this year also by consensus. Um, and I think this is, was an important um, as, and it was an important stepping stone in creating a more solid basis uh, when it comes to international norms around uh, restrictions on social media, and I think it does create a solid base also for this uh, FOC statement. Uh, but it's it's clear that the um, the um, the differences between different countries and their views and their strategies and ways those strategies are tied to longer term security policy goals are quite clear. Um, so we're concerned about that, especially the long-term hollowing of human rights broadly, I would say. Thanks. Thanks very much, um, Carl Frederick. I'm going to throw it open now. We've got a few minutes for discussion. I I'm really interested in getting people's experiences from elsewhere in the world about any patterns you see in social media and obviously any thoughts you have on how the coalition might be able to help. And I'll start at the back here. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, my, um, I have to make a correction first. Um, I, I work for the ICT Regulatory Authority of Turkey, and uh, the gentleman from Turkey said that uh, their workshop proposals about the internet censorship was uh, rejected because of uh, Turkish government's intervention, uh, as far as I understood. Uh, I have to say that that's not true, because as uh, most of you may know, uh, workshops are um, Workshops are uh, elected by the United Nations uh, units and uh, they determine which workshop proposals meet the criteria they determined. Uh, so uh, Turkish government has nothing to do with this decision. Uh, I have to make this correction. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, anyone else like to come in on the overall issue? Um, yeah. Thanks. Joy Liddy Cope from APC. Um, uh, and APC's welcomed the formation of the Freedom Online Coalition. We've actively engaged. We think it's really important that like minded governments do organise um, in uh, arguing strongly around human rights online. Um, and in relation to organising, particularly in norm setting environments like the Human Rights Council. Uh, and uh, seeing as the, um, the point's been raised in the, in the discussions, I mean, I, I'm very concerned about what the position of the Freedom Online Coalition might be in relation to the High Commissioner on Human Rights report on the right to privacy in the digital age, which will be being discussed in the Human Rights Council next week. Um, 
Uh, I'm troubled, I'm worried that we won't see the same sort of consensus that we've seen in the Human Rights Council on resolutions in relation to freedom online uh, and freedom of expression. We won't see that same consensus uh, on the right to privacy, um, including within the Freedom Online Coalition members. And I think we really need um, a clear sense of where the Coalition is sitting on that, um, how we can support Council uh, Freedom Online Coalition members um, and strengthening and deepening their positions on this issue, particularly when the, the, the High Commissioner's report has been very clear that mass surveillance is a violation of fundamental rights online. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's great that you can come to the, the Internet Governance Forum, we can participate and, and have that discussion. Um, and I think really in terms of our, our spirit, we really need something strong from the Coalition on this. So I, I just want a response on that, thanks. Thanks, Joy. I'll just um, I'll get a couple of others and then. Uh, Will from Internews in, in the USA. Uh, I have a question about uh, I just reading the statement, uh, and there's a concern that uh, that any restriction on social media use or blocking of social media use be based in law, and you have a rule of law kind of threshold with that, uh, particularly in cases where governments are citing national security or public order. I guess I'd like a little more of uh, you to uh, elucidate a little more of your thinking on this, and I'm thinking most recently of of the role of blocking or or addressing the use of social media in the immediate instance of conflict. Uh, a, a recent example would be the uh, alleged rape that occurred in Mandalay and the violence that occurred after that. I know the government of Myanmar has actually, uh, in, in, in I think the first instance, actually admitted that this, this was a false allegation, but the, the violence was then fanned by uh, uh, Facebook postings and so on. So I'd like if you could elucid uh, elucidate or illuminate a little bit of your thinking about those kinds of uh, moments when governments might have, in the absence of other protections and, and the delays involved in seeking a, a legal recourse, perhaps a justification to, to, uh, to shut down broadcast or uh, 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 um, media. Thank you. Thanks. And there are other governments in the room other than the ones on the platform, so they should feel free to come in and try and respond to any of the questions. Hi, uh, it's uh, Sharif from Amnesty International. Thank you very much for um, uh, the, the, the discussions. Um, uh, just w one thing uh, related to uh, freedom of online, uh, freedom of online, uh, sorry, freedom of expression online, in uh, especially in, in, in um, many other countries, is um, the export of, of surveillance trade, uh, the trade in surveillance equipment, and you know, without mentioning any specific companies, but we've seen in the past couple of years several examples of uh, uh, either equipment or software being exported and used by repressive regimes to, uh, to kind of quash uh, online uh, online expression. And it would be really good to see from uh, the, the members of the coalition a great greater effort to regulate this trade, to make sure that companies who are exporting um, uh, equipment that's being used or software for, for human rights violations that's being used for human rights violations, that this is much better regulated. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll take one more and then I'll, I'll come back to the panel. Hi, I'm Jessica Deere from Social Media Exchange, uh, an organization in Lebanon. And we're um, getting ready to publish a report that maps the um, Laws that are new laws that are affecting online expression in the Arab region. So, um, one of the trends, or two of the trends that we've noticed in this mapping is that there's a lot of correlation between new or amended anti terror laws, so called anti terror laws, and uh, new cybercrime laws. In the past three years, at, at least 12 cybercrime laws have been passed in the region. All of them criminalize speech across platforms, um, any sort of network device or platform. And the same goes for the anti-terror laws. And it seems to me that um, when we're talking about anti-terror laws or anti-cybercrime laws, if we or the countries represented of the Freedom Online Coalition are not also at every instance that we're talking about security and talking about cybercrime, if we're not also reinforcing um, the need to respect rights within those laws, because I know there are a lot of uh, coordinating meetings on developing cybercrime legislation, on developing anti-terror legislation, if we're not also including the rights aspects of those, at least as a matter of 
record that we're actually somehow kind of turning a blind eye to the problem. Um, but I, I, this is a this is just a trend that that I think it, it goes beyond the region as well. So. Thanks. So if we could just start getting responses. So we have a question about whether you think there's likely to be a consensus among coalition members on the report of the rapporteur that uh, Joy mentioned on privacy surveillance. So that, that's one question. Secondly, a question from Will from Internews, whether you think there are circumstances, what's your reaction to a government responding to a very immediate crisis saying it wants to shut down social media or an aspect. I guess that the Iraqi government, for example, would say if they were here, ISIS are dominating social media and using it to mobilize hatred and violence, so we needed to shut down the entire network. So I might come to you on that, Scott, because you mentioned Iraq for a response there. Then a question about the export of equipment. What is that's obviously an issue that a number of governments are looking at, but anyone who can respond on that. And finally, the importance, I think, of reiterating uh, the, the principles of human rights whenever we're looking at any kind of discussion on cybersecurity and cyber law. So I might come back to, to Simone on that, that latter point. But on the first one, I think I'm just going to dump you in it, Carl Frederick, in the absence of... So Fieke would better stop speaking to you. Do, do you think there's likely to be a consensus among the coalition governments on that, uh, on the current proposal? Uh, what's your sense of where, where it is? Um, that's, I, I will have to admit it's very hard to say. We haven't even been able to do our own legal analysis as of yet. So even for us, we don't have a fixed position yet. Um, this is a timing issue. I, of course, summer has just passed. But um, so honestly, I, I can't say that. I don't know. Um, but um, we will have to. We will have to that, see. Obviously, yeah. Okay, so nothing, nothing at this stage, I think. I mean, any other government has a, a view, please do say. Scott, anyone, anything you want to add to that or add on the point that Will raised about exceptional circumstances? Yeah, I'll echo what uh, Carl Frederick said. Uh, we're also finalizing our analysis of the report and beginning to talk with our allies about the many issues in the, in the report. I mean, the report is quite broad in the number of uh, issues uh, it deals with uh, and some of the claims it makes about what uh, the legally binding norms are. I, I um, would note that we are having a workshop on Friday morning. I think that APC is helping to organize, so maybe we'll provide you a fuller answer uh, uh, at that workshop. Uh, but I think there will be a number of, of uh, challenges there. Um, my, you know, the United States is very committed to staying in the tent as much as we possibly can, uh, staying engaged, uh, aiming for the consensus outcomes we achieved both at the Human Rights Council and at last year's uh, UN General Assembly. So that is our goal. Uh, whether we can get there remains uh, an open question. Uh, colleague in the back, Will, I guess, raised tough questions about. Uh, rule of law and how to deal with situations uh, uh, like that in Burma where there have been false reports that the government has shut down. First of all, in terms of rule of law, I mean, I think uh, maybe we should look at the statement again. I think when we talk about laws here, we're talking about legitimate laws, that is to say laws uh, adopted through a democratic, uh, transparent process that are consistent with international norms. Uh, the mere invocation of any old law is not sufficient for the rule of law standard to be met. Uh, and then, I mean, in the Burmese context, you know, if there is a false report put out uh, about violence, uh, either uh, Muslim on Buddhist or Buddhist on Muslim, you know, I think it's not unreasonable, given what's, uh, given what a tinderbox that situation is, for the government to conclude that 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 type of uh, allegation may be one that that should that has to be restricted. I mean, it's all situation uh, dependent, so I don't want to articulate any broad rule here, but I think it would not be unreasonable in, in a situation like, like that where the government knows that an alleged act is untrue for the government to, uh, you know, I think the first recourse is to immediately say it's that that's not true. I think that's the better response by a government. But if the government feels that, you know, 
the false allegation, the rumor has gone too far, then you know I think it's not unreasonable. Again, though, drawing a line between you know truth and rumor and that sort of thing is a is a is a tricky task. I mean, of course, in the United States, we believe that more speech is always the better antidote to problematic speech than than simply curtailing speech altogether. Um, but clearly, Article 19 uh, contemplates situations in which governments may need to uh, to restrict s speech in specific s circumstances. Thanks, uh, Stephen. I've got Stephen Lowe from the UK here. Uh, anything? Any reflection back on the question from Amnesty about the export of uh, surveillance equipment, which I know a number of governments are thinking about? I was. I wasn't. Checking, well, I was checking my email. I was checking to see whether we're tweeting about it tomorrow, because um, tomorrow actually is the anniversary of our uh, national action plan on business and human rights, which we launched September 4th last year, and we'll be sort of publicising some of the things we've done in the meantime. But one of the things that we haven't quite completed, because uh, we felt it was important to get it right rather than get it out by September the 4th, is some guidance that uh, is actually an industry initiative. Uh, a firm called Tech UK have been working on with our support and with civil society um, to do precisely that, which is about putting guidance out to companies who are exporting cyber equipment, uh, very much based around arms export guidance um, to enable companies to do due diligence to assess the risk that that, um, that, that uh, technology is likely to have and looking at the particular marketplace it's going into and the political circumstances. So I hope that goes some way to addressing the point you've made and uh, once it's formally launched I'll use the, the, the coalition to publicise it further. Um, and on, if I, while I've got the microphone, on the privacy report, I, mean, I think it's worth remembering that the Freedom Online Coalition is a it is a voluntary grouping of 23 like-minded countries. It's not a formal coordinating body, so we don't have to have a single position. And I don't think I've ever known a, a UN report that 23 countries happen to agree with every word on, on the day it was issued. But I think what we do have is um, we have commitments and, and statements through the coalition that we are all signed up to. And so our response to the report will be very much based on those shared values. Now, we may have different views on some elements of it, but we, we have a, a common understanding of what we do want to achieve in this field. Thank you. Thanks. And I know, I think, Sharif, if it, the International Secretary is based in London, if that UK report comes out, there might be an interesting opportunity for the International Secretariat to engage and give an assessment which they could share more broadly. Um, so on the last point, just coming to some, maybe in context of the working group on, on cyber security, would you see part of the role of the working group is looking, uh, emphasising the importance of rule of law and human rights standards in the way that cyber security policies are developed? Do you see that as being an important dimension to flag up, as our, as our speaker would have perhaps suggested? Yeah, I think um, so. Th probably we've been discussing the normative framework for embedding human rights in sort of national cybersecurity strategies, and I think that would be sort of exactly sort of the right angle to also tackle the problem of restricting anti-terrorism and and and, and cybercrime or cybersecurity laws. I think. Um, what you still often see, unfortunately, in, in cybersecurity or related policy is that it's quite um, reactive in, in the way that it's actually set up. So an event happens and then that is used as an opportunity to, to sort of uh, create new laws. And I think the procedure that is often follows doesn't take human rights um, uh, always sufficiently into consideration. So I think this is actually something that the working group could do very uh, valuable uh, work on. Okay, thanks very much, Simone. So, uh, we've got about five minutes left, so there is a quick opportunity for anyone to make a final comment if you're desperate at the end of the working day, after all your emails and many conversations. I sometimes think the conference, you know, there's basically, you sit in the workshops and do your email and you do all your talking around the bar and the coffee and the sandwiches, so maybe we should just suggest to the mag that they should rethink how the whole IGF works because people just come in and do their email in the workshops rather than actually take a full part in the conversation. Either that or we should just ban all social media and all laptops from events. That's my other, I think I might send that suggestion through to go to get a bit, bit more livelier interchange. Okay, um, I, think, I think that's probably it. I can't see anyone indicating. <clears throat> so first of all, can I ask you to join me in thanking the panel for their contributions and their debate and the speech.
secondly, just to remind you that the next Freedom Online Coalition meeting, if you are interested, is on the 4th and 5th in May in the wonderful city of Ulaanbaatar in the extremely wonderful country of Mongolia which will offer enormous opportunities both to meet a really incredibly friendly and engaged people, a community that's a really hungry to be part of these debates and part of the wider internet community. And I know they would love to see people there. So keep your eye on the coalition website, www.freedomonlinecoalition.com for details of that conference. And uh, myself and Leia here from the Secretariat are very happy to share our contact details so if you want to contact the coalition um, to make the contact rational and manageable for the governments, please do contact us and we can be in touch with you uh, and whatever issues you want to raise. So thank you very much uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.